And uh, if we looked at Megiddo from an aerial view, we would see the ruins, 27 layers of ancient ruins at Megiddo itself. 27 layers, a tell, we call this, where you build a city and, you know, you don't maintain your buildings very well and everything kind of crumbles down or you're conquered by an enemy and they destroy your city, reduce it to rubble, and you build on top and it goes to rubble and you build on top. 27 layers is Megiddo. But if we're talking about the mountain of Megiddo, does anybody see a mountain? We look really carefully. I'll help you out. Boom, there's your mountain. There's a mountain. It's like if you were to come to Salt Lake City and say the mountain of Salt Lake City. This wouldn't necessarily be a reference to a particular peak in the range, but to the range itself. So if you were talking about the mountain of, of Salt Lake City, you would say Wasatch, right? You wouldn't say, what is it, Stansbury? Mm, those are hills. The mountain of Salt Lake City, Wasatch. Well, I hate to break it to you, but here in Israel, yeah, we're going to have to settle for something a little smaller than the Wasatch. But, but it's, it's significant. It's, it is the mountain of Megiddo. And guess what mountain that is? Anybody have any wild guesses? Some of you already know. You've already studied this. You, you understand this, this uh, language within Revelation. That mountain of Megiddo is famously Mount Carmel. And when a reference is made to a battle, to a war, that is connected with this place called Harmageddon, Mountain of Megiddo, anybody in the first century with any Old Testament Bible knowledge would have thought Mount Carmel. They wouldn't have thought Iraq. They wouldn't have thought some apocalyptic end-time nuclear annihilation, they would have thought Mount Carmel. Showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal over the question of authenticity. The genuine God is the God who answers by fire. And so whoever's offering, whoever's sacrifice is answered by fire from heaven, that is the offering and the sacrifice to the true God. That identifies the true God. It is the ultimate showdown of which the best we can come up with here in the United States is the OK Corral. A bitter rivalry between some families, some law enforcement officers, some outlaws. Bitter feud ultimately decided. That's the idea. So we go to Revelation chapter 12, or sorry, 16, verse 12, and it says this. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up. Now that is a reference to a certain geographical area, not to the mountain of Megiddo, but to this other location, which begs the question, then why is that referenced? Why is something that is essentially in Iraq or a border at best, a border of the original territory of Israel, why is that suddenly referenced in this context? But notice this, the rest of the verse, to prepare the way for the kings from the east. There are clues in this verse. A reference to the Euphrates, a reference to it being dried up, and a reference to kings from the east. And again, somebody in the first century would have understood something. And I'm going to explain this to you, share this to you, and give us, give us this context, this broad context of this story. And I want to share, first of all, this note with you. The following, this next verse that I'm going to share with you was written by Isaiah before his death in 681 B.C. It's important for you to know this because of some names involved in this prophecy that Isaiah writes. This is Isaiah 44, starting with verse 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretches out the heavens and spreads out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of liars and makes fools of diviners. I like how the translators made that rhyme. That's pretty good, right? This is, this is almost some good quality rap here. I like this who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish, who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers. 
who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and of the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up their ruins, who says to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your river. Now, context is important here. Isaiah is prophesying during the Babylonian exile. So the people of Israel are in captivity, and they're in captivity to the powers of Babylon. They are in what is modern-day Iraq. And notice this word of hope to them. Their cities lie in ruins. Their temple has been destroyed. And from God, they're receiving this prophecy that Jerusalem will be inhabited. The cities of Judah will be built. Their ruins will be raised up. And and then this message to the deep. Be dry. I will dry up your rivers. When you are held in captivity, when you are imprisoned by this, this thing called Babylon, it is this overwhelming abyss that rules over your life, and God is coming in saying, I'm going to speak to the abyss that rules over your life, and I'm going to say to that bottomless ocean that separates you from from what you hope for, I'm going to say to that bottomless ocean, be dried up. I will dry up your rivers. I will make it possible for you to access what you are now separate from. And then, Remembering that this is by Isaiah, written quite early, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall fulfill all my purposes, saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built and the temple, your your foundation shall be laid. Notice the quotation marks there. This is this character Cyrus speaking. And this is what you need to understand. This is why I give you a date for the writing of this. Cyrus the Mede conquered Babylon in 539 B.C. Okay. We've got to do the math. Isaiah prophesies in 689. Cyrus conquers Babylon in 539. Remember in B.C. the bigger numbers are the older numbers and the smaller numbers are the more recent numbers. We do the math. 689 minus 539 is 150. Years before it happened, God names the king. Imagine getting this prophecy from Isaiah. Who's Cyrus? (laughs) Who's that guy? God says, 150 years from now, you'll get it. 150 years from now, you'll see that name. This would be a pretty easy prophecy to interpret, right? (laughs) A king comes into power. His name is Cyrus. He's like, where's that Isaiah scroll? (laughs) Let's let's dig that up because I think think it said some stuff. Cyrus? Cyrus? That's an interesting name. We've been waiting for him. We've been waiting for him. This is like calling the shot. This is like Babe Ruth pointing pointing to the fence (laughs) and calling his shot, saying, I'm going to hit it right there. This is like Joe Namath promising the winning of a Super Bowl in what, 1969. Only it's bigger than that. Because at least Babe Ruth is standing in the batter's box, right? If Babe Ruth is standing in the batter's box and he says, I'm going to hit it over there, yeah, there's a pretty good chance that's going to happen. He's Babe Ruth. If Joe Namath promises he's going to win the Super Bowl, at least he's in the Super Bowl. (laughs) At least the game is about to happen. And he's the quarterback. And he's Joe Namath. But Cyrus... Who's that guy? Nobody's ever heard of Cyrus. It's not going to be until 150 years later that we're even talking about Cyrus. But here he is, in Scripture, prophesied by a prophet of God to the people of Israel to give them hope while in captivity to Babylon. Why do I stand up in front of you every Sabbath quoting from an ancient book? This is part of the reason. It's not all of the reason, but it's part of the reason. A book that can tell you who the king is that will set you free from Babylonian captivity 100 years, 150 years before it happens. I want to read that book. I want to know what that book's talking about because maybe that book can help me understand some of the things that I'm going to be facing in the future and some of the things that are coming up from my perspective. That's part of the reason. 
happens 150 years later. And so, wouldn't it be fascinating if in our Bibles we also had some event that happened 150 years later that somehow spoke to this prophecy? Well, I direct you to Ezra chapter 6, verses 2 through 3. In the first year of who? Cyrus. Cyrus. Hey, here he is. Cyrus the king. Cyrus the king issued a decree. Do you notice this repetitive nature of this? Why do you think Ezra is repeating it twice? In the first year of Cyrus the king, did you hear that? Let me say it again. (laughs) Cyrus the king. Everybody getting this? Right? That's what Ezra's doing. He's writing his book and he's saying, "Uh, I'm, I'm putting this down for people. I want people to do the math. I want people to figure out what just happened here. Cyrus the king issued a decree. Now we have Cyrus the king being quoted. He was quoted in Isaiah 150 years before the guy was born. He's being quoted again. Concerning the house of God at Jerusalem, let the house be rebuilt, the place where sacrifices were offered, and let its foundations be retained. Cyrus shows So what what do we have in common with the prophets of Baal and with Babylon and with the OK Corral? What we have in common between all of those is this thing we call Armageddon. This battle, this showdown. By the way, how did Cyrus conquer Babylon? He diverted the river Euphrates, dried up the riverbed, This impenetrable city, the city with massive thick walls, had one significant weakness. It had a river flowing through it. And as long as that river was high and tall and and deep, as long as it was deep, remember that verse about the deep? As long as it is deep, Babylon is impenetrable. But if you've got a river flowing through your city, that river has to go under the wall. But if you don't have a river going through your city, (laughs) you have a tunnel going under your wall. And that's exactly what Cyrus does. God says, I will dry up your river. He's quoting Cyrus. Cyrus dries up the river. He diverts the river. Sends it off into another direction. There happened to be a system of irrigation that was, that was already kind of an old broken down system that was there in place upstream of Babylon. And he just reactivates it, diverts all the river water, and they come sneaking under the walls. And the, even, even the Cyrus stone, an ancient cuneiform a cylindrical stone, Cyrus himself records his conquest of Babylon. And he simply says this, we didn't have to kill a soul. We were able to come in without any kind of serious, violent opposition. We just showed up underneath the wall. I'm paraphrasing the cuneiform just a little bit there, but that's the idea. Armageddon. What is it about? Well, if it's about, if it's about uh, pe- God's people being set free from Babylonian oppression... If it's about Elijah having the showdown with the prophets of Baal, if that's what it's about, then it's, about, it's not about a military battle and military conquest. It's about a spiritual battle. And it's about truth. And it's about God. And it's about His kingdom. It's about light versus darkness. It's about genuine versus counterfeit. It's about good versus evil. It's about Christ versus Satan. That's what the battle of Armageddon is all about. So imagine how silly it looks when a war happens in Iraq and everybody thinks, oh, River Euphrates, this has got to be it. When in fact, the battle of Armageddon is a war that to some degree wages even now, but will one day become the OK Corral kind of event where The showdown happens. And in one way or another, the guns are ablaze. But because it's a spiritual crisis, because it's a spiritual battle, the guns aren't guns. The battle and the weapons of warfare 
are not against flesh and blood. They are against principalities and powers. You know, I find it disturbing that given the events of recent years, gun sales have skyrocketed as if somehow we're preparing for a literal war when we wrestle, wrestle not against flesh and blood. We tend to live in this two-dimensional idea where it's us against them, it's people against people, and we fail to recognize the, the vertical dimension of our conflict. And we fail to recognize that we do, in fact, wrestle not against flesh and blood. The battle isn't against each other. The battle is Christ and Satan. Two kingdoms in conflict. And we need to choose carefully which side we're on. Isaiah 45, starting with verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed. This is a continuation of Isaiah's prophecy. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. I want you to notice something there. Anointed? If we go back to the Hebrew text, And we read that word. Guess what we find? Thus says the Lord to his Messiah, to Cyrus. Anytime, I shouldn't say anytime, most of the time when you read the word anointed, like Samuel takes his flask of oil and he anoints David, son of Jesse, he messiahs him. Anointing and messiahing are the same thing. Thus says the Lord to his Messiah, to Cyrus. Blasphemy? No. This notion of God anointing, this notion of God choosing someone to champion and to save his people. Cyrus is a type of the Messiah to come. God says, I will go before you to level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes uh, in secret places that you, Cyrus, is still being addressed here, may know that I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by name, I call you by name for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen. I call you by name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other besides me. There is no God. What's the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal? The true God is the one who answers by fire. And Cyrus, a pagan king, is being addressed by God Almighty 150 years before he is born. And he's being told by prophecy, I call you by name. I'm going to call the shot. (laughs) I'm going to name the name of this anointed one who is going to come. You don't know me. Why does Cyrus not know the Lord 150 years before he's born? Because the unborn know nothing, right? (laughs) That's why. I am the Lord, there's no God besides me, there is no God, there's no other. Notice the rest of this prophecy to Cyrus. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun, from the where? Rising of the sun, where's that? The east, (laughs) the rising of the sun, and from the west, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, there is no other fascinating here that we have this this verse that is largely about the conquering of Babylon and the setting of God's people free, but it's also the language of Elijah and the prophets of Baal and the question of who the genuine God really is. If you're held captive in Babylon during the Babylonian exile, you could easily fall for the lie that God is powerless and Babylon is all-powerful, right? Right? You could easily come up with this, this feeling and this idea that somehow, if there is a God, he's, he's, he's off the clock. He, he's, he's abandoned you. He's no longer on the job. 
And he's left the powers of this earth in control, and you are at their mercy. But this prophecy comes through Isaiah saying, nope, God is alive and well. He has a plan. He has a way. And he's going to show up someday soon. Amen. There is none beside me. Don't fear Nebuchadnezzar. Don't feel Bel fear Bel Belshazzar. I am the Lord and there is no other. Notice what God says. I form light. I make well-being. I am the Lord who does these things. What God is describing here is his sovereignty. He's telling Isaiah and he's telling the people of Israel and he's even telling Cyrus 150 years before Cyrus is born, you're not in control, I'm in control. You're not on the throne, I'm on the throne. You don't rule, I rule. <laughs> this is funny because I made a slide and I didn't change the reference. This is actually in the Gospel of John, not Isaiah. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That was a little thought I woke up with. I added it to my slides and didn't quite edit it correctly. I form light, I make, I am. And Jesus said, I am. What we have going on here in this verse is this one that is speaking of this messianic figure, Cyrus, that's going to come along someday. This one that is speaking of that messianic figure is the ultimate messianic figure. The one who references Cyrus as his anointed is the anointed. There's one thing we learn about the story of Cyrus. It's a messianic king who brings down Babylon. It's a messianic king who defeats the prophets of Baal. It's a messianic king who shows up once and for all and sets the record straight. Deals with the evil in the community and brings in justice. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Notice that Cyrus is called by name. God calls the shot. Jesus is called by name. But I want to point you to one more thing in this story. Babylon is conquered to make way for the kings, plural, of the east. Not king, kings of the east. So we have this odd allusion to Cyrus, but it's, it's an allusion that is in plural. No longer a king from the east coming in, but kings from the east coming in. Why is it plural? Well, you know why. Because you already sang the song before this sermon. He knows my name. He knows my name. He knows my name. He's called your name too. To be a kingdom, to be kings, to be priests, to serve our God. And, and when Babylon is overthrown and way is made for the kings from the east to come in. What we find in Revelation is this is speaking of the final overthrow of Babylon. I'm going to talk about this in more detail in the future because I can't fit it all in this sermon. But when Babylon is overthrown... The river Euphrates, and we'll have to figure out what the river Euphrates really is, is diverted, and room is made for the liberators to come in and to set free those who are held captive by Babylon. And I'm thinking that you and I are a part of that invasion. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it's our desire that we could serve in your army. An army that does not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in high places. Spiritual forces of, of wickedness and darkness in this world that, that is not our brothers and sisters in this world. 
Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes to see that if we are fortunate enough to be kings and priests together with you, then that also means that within Babylon there are many brothers and sisters who are held captive against their will, who need liberated and freed by the providence that you give in as our messianic king diverting the river and giving us access into liberating those who are held captive. Father, I pray that as we think about that and as we look forward to the next message where we address that, I ask, Lord, that you would help us to know that our king rides ahead of us, that he provides, that he leads, that he conquers, and that he rebuilds. May that work begin in our hearts today as we are here bowed down before and worshiping you. And may you continue that work in us until you and your anointed son come to solve the crisis of this world once and for all. I ask that we would be a part of it in Jesus' name. Amen.